I would like to make a, a plea or an announcement. We really need some normative data. The normative data that we have is actually by the factory in Germany for the, our electrophysiology machine. And we are not Germans. And our parameters are yet to be known as, as a Saudi population. If you are interested, all what it takes is basically being dilated and um, uh, we, we, we're going to just dark adapt you for uh, 20 minutes and then we do the testing and, and it uses a, a contact lens, a Burin Allen contact lens. But this will be literally the first instance in Saudi Arabia where we collect Saudi normative data. So that's an achievement for all of us. Uh, and and uh, our doors are open, especially on, on Tuesday afternoon where there are no, you know, no commitments after, after the grand rounds. Uh, I'm offering personally coffee and, uh, and donut of your choice uh, on my own uh, expense uh, from Dunkin' Donut. So please don't hesitate, and if you find yourself free at any time, uh, after the grand rounds, just drop me a line. We can arrange for you to get tested and get your coffee and donut. And spread the word, please, for everybody, because we need this for our country, for our people, for our patients. Okay? So uh, I know that uh, I don't want to start on a negative note, but I, I know that most of the people either they switch off when we start talking about electrophysiology or they run away. So uh, and that it's it's something I'm really passionate about. So I try to simplify it as 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 much as possible, but you have to help me out. Because if you don't really interact with me, it's not it's, it's not gonna go like you know like one way. It has to be both ways. Okay. So, without further ado, basically, what we're gonna talk about today is is not something like complicated. I'm not gonna show you complex clinical cases. We we are here just to enjoy the journey actually of of a photon inside the retina. And think about it as simple as that. There is nothing else more than this. So basically, we're going to cover the origin of the signal in a normal retina. And think about it as if you're starting to read an ECG. But it's actually an ECG of the eye. And then the components of the response. Um, but then, as I mentioned to you, we want to collect normative data. So the reason for this is that the stimulus has to be standardized and the recording uh, equipment as well as the circumstances have to be as standardized as possible so you can compare. You cannot compare apples and oranges. You have to compare apples and, with apples and oranges with oranges. And um, and then the um, I'm trying to uh, kind of dispel the myth of a knee-jerk reaction that you get once you think there is some sort of retinal dystrophy, let's do an ERG, EOG. There are indications, and there are instances where you don't need an ERG, and there are instances where you need an ERG, and you have to think about both, you know, when you order a test for a patient. And then, I don't know whether we will have time and, and you will have energy to go to, so, through pathic mnemonic ERGs, but this is something that we can discuss either when you come to my clinic, if you are interested, or at another point in time. And we're going to speak about uh, a test that hopefully once we get the, the right equipment for it, we can actually do it more routinely for our patients, which is the pattern ERG, the stimulus, the response, and what are the uses of the pattern ERG, and then we're, we're going to talk about the uh, visual evoke uh, response. So this is actually a cartoon that I've uh, drawn when I was a PhD student. And this is the retina being drawn upside down like what the histologists do, you know. Usually the anatomists draw the retina upside down, the, the clinicians draw it the other way around. And that's basically um, uh, covers the cellular origins of the visual signal. So does the RPE have a visual cycle? Yes, it does have a visual cycle. Does it have an opsin of its own? It does have an opsin, but it doesn't respond to light. But there is a very strong and intimate relationship between the rod photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium. And the classic example for this, where electrooculogram is being used, is Best disease. 
So when you think about best disease, you think about the chloride channel in the retinal pigment epithelium. So, and you have to think about when the photoreceptors, when the rods become degenerate, degenerate then the whatever function comes from them in intimate relationship with the RPE is going to be subnormal. And therefore, having a subnormal EOG in somebody with retinitis pigmentosa doesn't mean anything. So you have to be selective about what, what to do and which test to request and why. And then you have the rods and cones, obviously. The cells that do not obviously contribute to a clinical grade ERG are the horizontal cells. And up to a certain extent, amacrine cells, you might argue otherwise that, you know, the ISO standard contains, at least in the old version, the uh, oscillatory potentials, but they are really hard to interpret, to be honest. And you can't really ascribe any, you know, particular pathology to them, except in cases where you want, for example, to investigate patients with diabetic retinopathy before they even develop the first microaneurysm. So there is a bit of research utility for the uh, OPs and the amacrine cell function, but again, clinical grade ERG, um, I mean, there isn't much information that you can gain from there. The other cell type that doesn't really show in, in, the, uh, in the clinical ERG are the horizontal cells, but they play a major role in, in color contrast, for example. So again, if you verge into psychophysics, color vision, things like that, you have to think about horizontal cell function. But the classic cells that contribute are definitely the on and off bipolar cells. And then you have the gangrene cells. So uh, I usually ask this question in the clinic and you know, I kind of say, okay, you, you will have a coffee on me if, if you answer this question. Which cells in the retina give you uh, a graded potential? And which cells actually generate an action potential? And what's the difference between the two? And most of the residents really switch off and then they they don't want to show up to the clinic next day. Which I find funny because, you know, sometimes I ask a question because I want people to think about it. And, and the reason for this is that um, graded potential, it means that as you increase the stimulus intensity, there will be an increase in the response. Right? But if the cell is generating an action potential, it means like it's yes or no. As simple as that. Okay, so the only cells that generate an action potential in the retina are the ganglion cells and the amacrine cells. All the other cells actually generate uh, graded potential, which means that you can play with the parameters of the stimulus and then you would expect an increase or a decrease of your response accordingly. Does that make any sense? Okay, any, any questions so far or did you switch off already? Okay. Now, let's start from, from the beginning. I mean, we are walking around with miracles inside our eyes. And that's not an overstatement, that's not an exaggeration. Basically, <clears throat> what you have is a protein inside the retina, and this protein is tied up to uh, a vitamin A derivative, the aldehyde, okay? So, the protein is the opsin, and it's a visual pigment. What does that mean? Is that Photons are drawn to pigments, or pigments absorb photons. And this is the beginning of the miracle that we call vision. Okay? So, why am I I'm bothering about this? Is because when you come to my genetics clinic, for example, you will find quite a lot of numbers and letters, and these are the names of the genes. And in the beginning, when I started working in genetics, I thought, I can't really memorize anything. I mean, they seem to me like, you know, car plates. They're just numbers. And, but then, when you think about things mechanistically, you start understanding, okay, here are the numbers, here are the terms, and they are just acronyms for what's happening in the retina. You start by, by the photon being absorbed by the, say for example, we're talking about the rods now, absorbed by the rhodopsin, activated rhodopsin, so now you have a rhodopsin that's been activated, activates tran transducin, okay? And then transducin that's activated will dissociate the phosphodiesterase 6. ACE means an enzyme. So when you have a dissociation, what happens? 
the enzyme becomes activated. So it's usually dormant until something knocks the door and, and wakes it up. Okay? All of these steps are just needed to cause hydrolysis of cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP, which is the, the, the messenger inside the cell, will close the channel. So I mentioned early on this afternoon that um, the retina responds in, 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 in a limited way to the, the stimulus that comes to it. And the stimulus in this case is the absorption of the photon. And I mentioned that mice who are, that are kept in the dark all the time might develop retinal degeneration. And the reason for this is that with no light, the channel will be open and it will allow ions inside the photoreceptor cell. Now, the cell can kick out some of the you know, cations, but especially calcium can enter the photoreceptor all the time. And that's why degeneration might happen. Okay? So, what does light do is simply closing this channel. And now the photoreceptor that is always depolarized in the dark will become hyperpolarized. So, what does depolarization, hyperpolarization mean in terms of electricity? Can anyone just give me a wild guess? Exactly. You're absolutely right. So, when, when hyperpolarization happens, then glutamate release will be reduced. So it's quite the opposite to what you would expect. Most of the cells, when they are stimulated, actually they depolarize, but not the photoreceptors, it's the opposite. Okay, so when calcium influx is reduced, then hyperpolarization, as my colleague mentioned, happens, and then glutamate release is reduced, and then the cells at the synapse become activated. Okay, why do we have such, um, you know, numerous steps why don't we just like absorb the photon by rhodopsin and then like, or even not rhodopsin, absorb the photon by something that hydrolyzes the cyclic GMP and that's it? Can anyone give me a wild guess why? Why we have so many steps here? Yes. So, okay, that, that's, that's a good answer. But then the, the number of steps, why don't we have like one or two steps and that's it? Why don't we just link the channel to a protein that opens and closes it? Sarah Sosson mentioned recycling. Any other thoughts? Okay, so if I give you, um, I give you a hint. The hint is there is one too many which means that one activated rhodopsin, for example, will activate many transducin molecules. And then, yes, and then each one of these activated transducin molecules is going to, you know, dissociate more of the enzyme. Propagation. Pardon? Propagation. Hmm? Propagation. Of propagation. Propagation is something that happens at the synapse, but the, the word, I, I know what that, that you mean, uh, amplification. So it's actually multiplied so many times to the extent that if you are really under strict dark adaptation, under experimental conditions obviously, and I stimulate a single rod in your eye with a single photon, you could be hypersensitive to the extent you could actually perceive it. If it's, it was a one-to-one, -one, it will never reach your brain. Okay, so that's one important thing. The other thing is that once you activate all of this, you have to deactivate it. And there are other proteins that actually kind of switch off because if it continues to be active, you will be constitutively active and then you will no longer see anything. And this, I think what happens in patients with a certain type of congenital station night blindness, which is not the synaptic disease, there are certain mutations in rhodopsin, for example, that just keeps rhodopsin on and on and on and on. It never switches off. Another example is a Gucci disease. 
which I think Dr. Noelati is an expert in. I think I, I picked up one case when I was a resident or fellow. I was so scared. I saw the reflection. I just like ran away. But um, that, that's the moment I fell in love with medical retina. So um, in a Gucci disease, there is a rhodopsin kinase, which actually kind of dismantles the activated rhodopsin, deactivates it. Okay? And there is another protein that's called S antigen protein, which also kind of, after you dismantle the activated rhodopsin, you actually put a cap, like you put a lid, so you'll switch off. If you don't switch it off, you will be night blind. Okay? So this will lead to um, any questions so far? No? Okay. This will lead to now hyperpolarization. Now we're talking again. Again, this is one of my cartoons. I used to be an artist when I was a PhD student. I don't know, I lost it now. So what happens now at the synaptic terminal? You have this is the edge of the photoreceptor, and this is an on-bipolar, this is an off-bipolar cell. So glutamate is released in the dark, OK? And do you remember when I was talking about calcium binding protein for? Actually, it binds this calcium. Little cute protein here that actually can destroy the function of vision, but at least it's not a degenerative disorder. Okay, this little, you know, channel is where the calcium actually exits the photoreceptor as well. And this is a voltage-gated calcium channel. Again, any mutation that damages this channel actually causes similar condition to the one that I've just shown you earlier. You see, you can link act actually pathology with physiology if you understand the link between them and then you will never forget it. Okay? Now, we finished from the synapse. This is what happens at the synapse. Any derangement can cause a synaptic disorder. Equally, if something happens here in the on-bipolar cell, again, a problem can happen. What I just wanted to emphasize here is that uh, when the photoreceptor hyperpolarizes, the off-bipolar cells hyperpolarize with them. But the on-bipolar cells depolarize. And that will become handy, you know, just in a few moments. So think about it. The on is the opposite. The off is always the friend of the photoreceptors. One more point, the rods don't have access to off-bipolar cells. So it's only the cones who are privileged enough to have connection to both the on and off. And you might ask me a question, then why do we need on and off-bipolar cells? Why can't we just function with one of them? You can if you are under dark adapted conditions because you can only go up when it comes to the light. You see because you see light. But imagine if you have a range of light that is from dusk or dawn to our midday you know, sun. How can your photoreceptors handle this? And when you think about it, whoever came to my clinic and saw patients with achromatopsia, simply just switching off the light makes them even talk to you comfortably. So imagine if you are walking around with, with the on system only. So what does the off system do in the cones is that it actually signals decrement in light. So they work hand in hand to give you a wide range. That's how you see. Okay. Moving on. So the rod light response, I'm not going to give you so many details because you, you know it's, uh, it's late in the day. But suffice it to say that this is the rod specific ERG. And broad specific ERG is evoked by a very, very dim light after dark adaptation, not before. So after dark adaptation, your rods become sensitive, and then you can use a dim light to actually evoke a response. But because the response is small at the level of the photoreceptors, what you see is the amplified signal from the on-bipolar cells. See, so the rod specific ERG is driven by the rods, but actually what you see here is the on-bipolar cell function. 
And what does that mean is that if you have this completely flat, you can't really tell whether it's the rods or the own bipolar cells. Okay? You increase the flash intensity, and because I mentioned early on that it's a graded potential, the more light you give the photoreceptor, the more response you get, then you see the hyperpolarization going down there. Okay? Hyperpolarization of the photoreceptors, transmission. First, this is what um, John Robson calls the nose. And, and this is a very, um, very delicate issue. Uh, if, you, if you come to my clinic, we can discuss it over a cup of coffee and we can talk about KCNV2 and the loss of the nose. But we don't have noses now, so this is the earliest transmission between the outer segment of the photoreceptor and the inner segment. We haven't even left the rods yet. But the kinetics of hyperpolarization are all represented here in the ascending limb. You go up past this point is the oscillatory potentials, and then the B wave is actually um, mainly on bipolar cell function, but since you've already switched the light on and you increase the flash intensity, even dark adaptation, there might be also some response coming here from the dark adapted cones and the off bipolar cells. But you can't really extract it and dissect it cleanly at this stage. Is that clear? It's, it's, yeah, yeah. We, we need to sit over coffee. I can't explain it in two minutes. Either. But I just wanted you to remember there is a nose in the, in the ERG. The cone light response is represented here. We mentioned, so if you just look back here, I intentionally omitted the off bipolar cells. Now they're showing back again. And basically, you have two stimuli or uh, two conditions under which you test the cone responses. The first one of them is the uh, flicker, 30 hertz flicker response. So can anyone tell me why we don't use flicker response for the rods? Or the other way around, why flicker response is something that we can test the cones with and we are really 100% sure that the rods do not interfere. Go ahead. Okay, uh, that's a good answer. I will just rephrase. Um, so under dark adaptation, you can actually use flicker up to 20 hertz, and you can get a response from the rods. But beyond this frequency, the rods wouldn't be able to catch up, and that's uh, um, uh, actually a parameter where I just showed you that the rods have to de you know, after activation, they have to be deactivated, and all of these kinetics take time. So that's why they cannot keep up, even if you are doing flicker, you know, testing under dark adaptation, strict dark adaptation. Does that make sense? Okay. So you're absolutely right. Once you light adapt the, the, uh, the subject, then you, one, you are trying to light adaptation means that you're actually switching off the rods. But the second thing is the high frequency. So, uh, there have been quite a, a lot of experimental data that suggest that if you kill the function, you can do this pharmacologically in, in animal models. If you kill the function of both the on and off bipolar cells, you end up with only 20% of the amplitude here. And that's the contribution of the cones. So 80% of this is the contribution of the on and off bipolar cells. Which means that if you do this, for example, in somebody with, say, CRVO, central retinal vein occlusion, you might actually have a little bit of a response and that is driven by the photoreceptors. So it's not completely abolished unless the patient is really a vascular path. So that's one way of dissecting things. Also CRAO, again, if the patient is not a vasculopath, for example, accidental or something, if you theoretically do an ERG, you will find that 
you might have just like 20% of the response. So why bother with high frequency? Well, it tests the sensitivity. It's like a stress ECG for the cones. It does not specifically dissect which cell type is actually affected, but it tells you that there is something wrong going on with the retina. You want to dissect it further, then use the single flash response. And this is an A wave. The A wave is driven by the hyperpolarization of the cones and the off bipolar cells because they go together. But then by the time the cones depolarize again, and the off bipolar cells also depolarize again, the depolarization of the off bipolar cells and the on bipolar cells is added up and constitutes the B wave. Make sense? So, ERG represents very controlled light stimuli because, you know, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a machine. You have to have a, a standardized input so you can measure the output reliably. So, the light stimuli should be calibrated and should be measured very well. And then you have the electrical responses recorded and then you analyze the ERG and then you make your diagnosis. Again, the diagnosis the electroretinographic diagnosis is not a clinical diagnosis. You can, as a, an electrophysiologist, you can or you should actually describe the ERG. And that's it. If it has particular pattern, if the waveform is suggestive of something, you can say X, Y, Z, these are the findings, and you stop at that. So try not to put multiple hats at the same time. Try to, and do not try to fit the ERG into the clinical picture that you see. Because sometimes the discrepancy can give you the answer, actually. So if you change the adaptive state of the eye, like what uh, my colleague is, is my doctor? Well, no. Dr. Faisal said that under light adaptation, the rods wouldn't be able to catch up with the fast flicker. So adaptation, adaptive state of the eye is important. And since we mentioned light adapted and dark adapted state, there is also another state that's called mesopic level of vision. Mesopic level of vision is the time when both the rods and cones are actually both functional. And this is typically during dusk and dawn. And you might find some patients actually struggling, particularly during that time. And the nature of the stimulus, so not only the stimulus intensity, the, whether you use white light or use certain colors, like red flashes and blue flashes, you can also, and, and the background, so say for example, if you get you know, advanced in, in electrophysiology, we can talk about on and off ARGs, where you can actually have an amber background to suppress the rods completely, and then you can extract the on and off ARG using a blue flash on, on an amber background. So changing the nature of the stimulus can enable you to dissect the different retinal cell types and layers. One thing that I uh, didn't mention at, uh, at the time when, uh, when we were talking about the uh, cells that generate the electrophysiology, electrophysiological signal, is that the standard ERG does not contain any contribution from the ganglion cells. And this is something you have to keep in mind. So if you bring me a patient with total optic atrophy, advanced glaucoma, the full field DRG is going to be normal. But that doesn't mean that the patient is going to see. Okay. So again, just to recap, the RPE generates the electroocleogram. We talked about the uh, B wave the cells that generate the response. The last thing that uh, I, I have yet to talk about is the pattern ERG, which is basically reflects the, gang, uh, the ganglion cell function driven by the cones. So it's, it's, a, it's a contrast response. It's not a luminance response. So the stimulus is a checkerboard. It's not a flash. Okay, And the P50 is, a, is actually a, an on an off bipolar cell response driven by the cones, and the N95 is actually, after the signal travels through the on and off bipolar cells, actually it goes through the ganglion cells, and then you get the N95. 
So in somebody with advanced, uh, say for example, multiple sclerosis, for example, where the patient had demyelination and you know retrograde degeneration of the ganglion cell t has taken place, you might find that the P50 might not be severely affected. It can be still affected, but not severely affected, but then the N95 is lost. Okay. So uh, I'm going to skip this, but basically the, the parameters that you should be looking at are the amplitude and the peak time. I like to call it peak time rather than latency or implicit time, just to avoid confusion. And then you have to also inspect the waveform and then you can describe your ERGs. Uh, we talked about this, and uh, this is the rod specific dark adapted 0.01 candela second per meter square response. It assesses the rod system system. I didn't say rod photoreceptor, and this is this should be borne in mind. It's the rod system sensitivity. You want to go to specificity and you ascribe your um, components to certain cell types in the retina, then you use the bright flash. Okay? You can even increase the flash intensity up to 30 uh, candela second per meter square that might give you even more details and information about the retina. But that's something that we can discuss later on. We talked about the flicker. We talked about the, uh, stand, the, the single flash, which is basically a two hertz response, or, or the, the stimulus is a two hertz uh, flash, okay? And the origin is the cone photoreceptors and the inner retina. The A wave is actually a summation of the cone photoreceptor and the hyperpolarizing bipolar cells, which is the off bipolar cells. And then the B wave is actually a summation of the depolarizing and hyperpolarizing bipolar cells. Again, in other words, off and on bipolar cells. Okay, so now we move to uh, the recording equipment. Any questions so far? Everything is clear? Okay, so this is what we call the Gansfeld uh, dome. The Gansfeld dome, the advantage of the Gansfeld dome is that it's actually painted white in a special uh, paint that actually allows the light to diffuse equally from all the directions and all angles of the eye. Okay, and therefore, uh, you know, you have to pay attention that the any scratches inside or any even changes in the texture of the painting inside might affect how the, your stimulus is being delivered to the eye. Gansfeld means full, full, yeah, full field, but it's also the, the painting inside. So if, if somebody actually wipes it with, with a harsh material or alcohol or something, because it's actually, if you touch it from inside, it's not smooth. It's matte, okay? So these tiny, actually, dimples actually reflect light as well. And that's why you have to be very careful about maintaining your machine. Because sometimes, you know, when you have to, you know, some patients can drool inside and things like that. So you have to follow the instructor manual, the, the instructions manual, so you, you know how to clean it after using it for a patient, rather than damaging the paint. And the types of recording electrodes. Uh, basically, you have the uh, contact and non-contact electrodes. The idea here is that what you are doing is basically you are trying to measure the response that travels all the way from the retina through the cornea. So theoretically, the jet uh, electrode, for example, might give you higher amplitude, just like the Buren Allen lens that we use here at KCASH. It gives you higher amplitude, but again, it's not really comfortable for the patient, and sometimes it can cause corneal abrasions. Then you can have the, uh, the DTL, which is basically um, a silver uh, impregnated thread that actually the silver is the conducting material and you can just stick it so it will just, uh, you know, at the margin of the eyelashes, so it will be just in contact, gentle contact with the cornea. And the gold foil electrode that uh, is used at, at Morfields. <coughs> 
with these non-contact electrodes, or sorry, they are still contact electrodes, but they are not really, you know, obscuring the visual axis, you can still do the pattern ERG, because for the pattern ERG, the patient shouldn't be dilated, should be fully refracted, and using their, their you know, correct refraction, and the image should not be optically degraded, otherwise your pattern ERG is not going to be correct. And then obviously, these are the recording electrodes, you have to have also reference and ground electrodes. Okay, so you have a recording, you have a reference electrode, because basically what you are doing is that your machine is extracting the difference between the reference and your recording electrode. Because if you don't use a reference electrode, whatever noise that comes from, say, for example, the muscles of the patient are just like, you know, moving their face or smiling or talking or something, it might actually interfere with the signal. So you have to subtract one from the other to get your pure signal. Okay? And this is just the standard ERG as we see it. Uh, in my clinic, uh, we currently convert it to the ISO standard ERG. Uh, I omitted the dark data 3.0. It's a middle step between the dark data 0.01 and the 10. And it, and it gives you an idea because if you put it in the middle here and you should be able, as you increase the flash intensity, you should be able to see an increase of the amplitude of your response. If you don't see this increase, then you should be alerted that something might be wrong with the retina, obviously. So what are the you know, parameters that affect the, uh, your ERG? One thing that I really stress on is the pupil diameter. Okay? It's a surrogate for the pupil area, but this is something, it's a principle for something that we call the trollant. Trollant is a unit of measuring the light that is actually arriving at your retina. So if you don't control this, you don't know what you're doing. Because if you do an ERG for somebody whose pupil diameter is only two or three millimeters, it's totally different from somebody who's got a pupil diameter up to seven or eight millimeters. The amount of light getting inside the eye is different, and this might change your interpretation completely. So this is something you have if somebody has got posterior synechia, if somebody wasn't dilated well, you have to note this. And, it, and whoever is interpreting the ERG should take this into account as well. Because you might tell somebody like, oh my god, you've got throat cone dystrophy, or you've got... Well, they're completely normal, simply because they weren't dilated enough at the time of, um, of testing. Another thing is that you have to pay attention if the patient has got cataract or not. A white cataract will act like a filter, obviously, to decrease the amount of light getting inside. But also, posterior subcapsular cataract can work like a diffuser. And it might paradoxically also increase the amplitude a bit. So you have to note in your request even whether the patient has got cataract or not. And obviously eye closure. Um, I don't want to get into this because stroke flash is something that probably you've never seen, seen, so it's really difficult to explain it to you. But, you know, if you use Gansfeld, it means that you have equal and wide distribution of your stimulus. But if you, if you use a stroke flash, for example, for a kid, you just stick it right in front of them instead of actually putting the whole dome around, then you will get different responses, obviously. And there is also the, you have to pay attention to patients who have got high myopia. So the longer the axial length, the more likely that you are going to record a little bit of a lower amplitude. But the timing in a normal myopic eye should be normal. So this is something that you have to, to bear in mind. If the peak time is, is shifted, then there is a pathology there. It's not only the, the myopia. Uh, we were talking about, you know, the, uh, the ERG intensity. As you increase the intensity, you're actually developing more and more enlargement of the response. And this is something that um, probably you might notice this in, in, in the three candela. You might notice like a bifid wave, bifid A wave. 
And that's why the ten candela can give you this uh, discrimination. Because when you put the timing, you don't know whether this is the A wave or that's the A wave. So if you increase the flash intensity, it becomes really, really well defined. And then you can put your timing confidently. Okay. So I'm going to just skip this because you know what ERG is used for now. Uh, we're going to talk about the pattern ERG, which is basically isoluminant black and white reversing checkerboard. So isoluminant, it means that the luminance of the board on the monitor, which is like a checkerboard, okay? the luminance is equal all the time. It doesn't change. What changes is actually the black checker will become white and the white become black. And this reversal actually is what induces the response in your ganglion cells. Okay? And that is different from the multifocal ERG because the multifocal ERG is a luminance response. Even if you see these hexagons actually changing from white to black, it's actually the luminance response that drives uh, the, the multifocal ERG unlike the pattern. And that's why the multifocal ERG is not sensitive to optical degradation. If you put a contact lens on, if the patient is like defocusing and things like that, you can still get a multifocal ERG. That's not the case with the pattern ERG. And then you have the uh, visual uh, evoked response, and it reflects the activity of the areas of the visual field that are represented at the surface, at surface of the cortical gyri, which means that you're recording from here, okay? You're putting your electrodes, and it must be interpreted in conjunction with the ERG and pattern ERG. So why is that? Because the flash VEP is actually dominated still by macular response. Why is that? The reason for that is the, the area of the cortex that is dedicated to the macular um, function is quite large compared to the other accessory areas. So even if you have a flash stimulus, still if you have macular dysfunction, you can misinterpret it. And we've seen quite a few cases where the patient family were told like, Okay, we're, you know, the patient has got, say, for example, nystagmus, a child with nystagmus, VEP was done, no ARG, nobody looked at the macula, and then the par parents were told, okay, your son has got um, optic atrophy. You look at the nerve, the nerve is fine, and then the patient is pushed to do an MRI, and then MRI doesn't show anything, you know? And the reason for that is that if you don't use it in conjunction with understanding what's happening in the retina and in the macula, you can misdiagnose quite a lot of cases as optic neuropathies, while the problem originated from the retina. So everything is driven from the retina to the cortex, visual cortex, not the other way around. Understood? Okay. So we just covered this, and it's only in the cases where you know, say for example, a patient who has been on anti-TB treatment and they presented with a visual field defect, or dyschromatopsy for that matter. And you do, say for example, you don't have pattern ARG, you do like visual field, okay, there is a bit of a scotoma there. And you wanted to know whether it's related to the TB medication or not. Then a visual evoked potential can show you whether actually the patient has developed optic neuropathy or not. But you know for sure that the retina is working fine. Okay, it could be a, some, something in the chiasm or something retrochiasmal. So try not to interpret VEP on its own unless you're sure that the retina is doing fine. Okay, so you can diagnose optic neuropathy and retrochiasmal dysfunction and it's you usually also useful in the diagnosis of ocular albinism. Sometime, sometimes I talked earlier uh, this afternoon about ocular albinism. And sometimes the skin tone, because it's, uh, it's X-linked, the skin tone and everything is normal. You don't have the mother to examine. And all what you have is someone with subnormal acuity and foveal hypoplasia. Then you can use your uh, multi-channel VEP to uh, demonstrate chiasmal misrouting. Again, the full field DRG is going to be normal, 
and you can just like you know when you look at the right channel versus the right left channel when you are stimulating one eye you can see that actually there is a cortical predominance contralateral predominance and then you can diagnose the albinism makes sense okay. so this is actually one of my colleagues from Morfields he's now a clinical scientist at the time he was uh, still studying I owe him quite a lot his name is Sean Liu and he's uh, quite um, a very uh, ambitious and polite young man. I hope that I can bring him to lecture also alongside with me one day. So this is the placement of, of your electrodes. I'm not going to dwell on it because you know you have to you know you have to wash your hair after this. <laughs> um, so basically you have your uh, middle channel and then you have the right channel and then you have the left channel. So this is for the standard VEP. For the multi-channel VEP you have to use five channels an extra one here, an extra one there, to be able to um, to see the propagation of the signal from the midline all the way to each side. Okay. So uh, these are the uh, this is the strobe uh, flash that I was talking about early on that you can use sometimes in pediatrics. So over at Morefields, we never do examination and the sedation. To be honest, you can have it in a in a in an awake baby, and you can just distract them put some electrodes on the skin, okay? And then you can use your flash strobe to actually evoke the responses and, and, and get the measurements. Obviously, the pediatric ERG is qualitative and not quantitative. So it gives you a yes or no, it gives you whether it's achromatopsy or not. But then the nitty gritty details, it gives you also electronegative ERG. But then the nitty gritty details, you have to wait for the child to grow up for them to have a full field ERG, the standard one. This is the checkerboard I was talking about. And you can use also pattern reversal VEP. So what's the difference between the pattern onset and pattern reversal VEP is that now you can test the visual pathways using a pattern so you can see the response to a contrast stimulus as, as much as you can do that for the macula using the pattern ERG. And the pattern onset VEP has the advantage of if the patient is defocusing, if you are investigating a patient, for example, for a medical legal uh, case, somebody who's been hit on the head, for example, and they want a huge sum of money in compensation, and they claim that it, they cannot see. You do your full field ERG and it's completely normal, you do the pattern ERG, it's completely normal. If the patient is clever enough, they can actually defocus and give you this and they can, you know, say, okay, I don't see. And you can't really, you know, <laughs> argue against that. But if you use the pattern onset VEP, by the time they try to defocus and refocus again, actually this change can disclose the response. And you can play with the contrast and you can play with the checker size to even estimate the visual acuity using VEPs. So it, it is that powerful if you use it right. So uh, I'm not going to dwell on this for such a long time, but the, the pattern reversal VEP, uh, the major positivity uh, at 100 uh, milliseconds, and this is what you really you know, look for when you interpret the, the VEP. The pattern onset VEP has a little bit more complexity. I'm not going to dwell on it at this stage. So again, if you change the contrast of your monitor or if you don't even calibrate your monitor, sometimes it can give you lower contrast and then your responses might be different to what you would expect. The check size, the smaller they are, the higher the resolution. So if you have somebody, say for example, uh, with, uh, with say for example macular dystrophy and you want it still to check the paramacular responses, then you can play with the check size so the coarser they are the less the resolution, but then you can see whether actually the macula is functional or not. You can change the luminance, as we mentioned that for the pattern ERG, the stimulus is isoluminant, so you don't really change it, it's actually the contrast, and the field size. So for 15 degrees, it means it's the distance between the center of the uh, optic disc and the center of the fovea, that's roughly 15 degrees of visual angle on the retina. But then if you have somebody with Stargardt disease, for example, and you want it to measure larger area than the atrophic area, then you can use 
the 30 degrees. Simply project the monitor, bring it closer to the patient by 50% of the standard distance, and then you can project onto a larger area of the macula. And this is the 30 degrees uh, pattern ERG. I'm not going to dwell on the, um, the rest, but uh, say, for example, if somebody has got, you know, spasm, for example, of or they are squeezing their eyes and things like that, it can also affect not only the, the, uh, the pattern ERG, the, the pattern VEP can be also affected. And muscle spasm also. So patients have to be quite relaxed. If they have muscle spasm of their neck, for example, uh, they, you might not get very good recordings. Refraction, concentration, arousal, ptosis, nystagmus, all of these things, muscle artifact, as we just mentioned. Do you still have energy to, it's almost an hour now. Can we have a vote? Who wants to continue? Okay. Who doesn't want to continue? It's fine, I don't, everybody's masked here, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, feel free to, to interrupt me at any point because, um, you know, it's late in the afternoon and probably I, I need you to be um, awake. Otherwise, it won't be fun. Okay, so the ERG can give you an idea about how the retina works, as we just mentioned, but you can't really pinpoint, sorry, pinpoint the pathology just looking at the ERG, except in three conditions. And fortunately, actually, we do have these three conditions in Saudi patients. Even the most rare of them is actually is, um, is a family that's been published uh, by Dr. Arif Khan, and I, I think they are generous enough to actually come back to us if, if we call them back. So we do have all the three pathognomonic ERGs here in Saudi. It's, it's, a, it's a unique chance. So if you come to my clinic, um, you might come across a family with uh, this disorder, KCNV2 retinopathy which is basically the term KCNV2 might not mean much to you, but if I tell you it's cone dystrophy with supernormal rod ERG, you should think about two things. The rod ERG is really high amplitude compared to what the retinal function looks like, and even when you take history from the patient, they are not really that good when it comes in, in, in the dark. But paradoxically, they are electrically hyper. Okay? The second thing is that they have severe cone dysfunction. They have poor color discrimination. Uh, I noticed that Saudi patients, probably because of the sun, they're used to the sun more, more than the Western patients with KCNV2 retinopathy, because they feel like their vision is further degraded in bright light, but they are not extremely photophobic as the ones I've seen in London. So think about somebody who doesn't really feel comfortable in bright light, but they are not as photophobic as patients with achromatopsia, for example. Dyschromatopsia, they don't see colors well, they don't manage very well in, under very, very dim light, okay? They also have reduced visual acuity, but I've seen um, a spectrum from 2030 vision up to 2300 and 2400. And some of those patients start off as children with relatively good visual acuity if you manage to correct their refractive error because they can be sometimes highly myopic. Okay, so if you escape the fate of amblyopia because of amyotropia, some of them can start off with relatively good visual acuity, but eventually they deteriorate as they grow older. Okay, so the thing is, the current literature suggests that some patients can evolve into a picture of cone rod dystrophy, but none of them goes blind. And that's something you have to, so if you make this diagnosis, this is actually good news for the family. Because even if their vision deteriorates, they're not going to go blind. And that's something you have to keep in mind. And the imaging can be highly variable. Uh, this is from the paper by Panos. And I think whoever rotated with me in the clinic might have seen a few patients like this. They look, I mean, the OCT looks more or less like achromatopsia patients. You can see these, um, you know, kind of optically empty or hyperreflective spaces uh, in the outer retina and the fovea. And sometimes total collapse can happen 
just like this, for example, you have total loss of the ellipsoid zone. But these kind of tiny defects can, can be there, and this can give you a clue. The other thing is that I mentioned that those patients are myopic, and whoever rotates with me sometimes will say, how would you know that the patient is myopic? Sometimes they don't have like a myopic crescent or something. When you look at the choroid underneath, it's quite thin. So that's another clue. Okay. So the phenotype can be highly va variable, and if you look carefully here, for example, this hyper fluorescence is teeny tiny, and sometimes it can be easily missed, especially on the optos, because the optos doesn't really focus on the, on the macula. But if it's there, see, for example, say, for example, this looks more or less nearly like normal, but if you think about it, or if you look carefully, you'll find that the outer nuclear layer is, is relatively thinner than what you would expect. I don't know, maybe from last year, some of you might have been here when I talked about the foveal development. You have to cram a lot of cones here in the center. And that's why when it's thin like this, you know that there is a problem. Okay. Now, don't get, don't get scared by this because this is like a research grade ERG, but you can start with very, very dim flash. And in a normal subject, this is the normal ERG, and this is um, an ERG from somebody with KCNV2 retinopathy. So the main features are simply, under very, very dim flash, there, there is no response. It's completely undetectable. While you can reach an amplitude of about 200 microvolts in somebody, uh, in a normal person. But then, what gives it away is the dark adapted 0.01, where you can have a subnormal an extremely delayed response. And then, as you increase the flash intensity, what you will see is that the response becomes really exaggerated. Okay, you reach here, and it's already like you can see that in normal, okay, you're reaching up to, say, for example, 600 microvolts. And you wouldn't expect somebody who started off like this to actually build up such a huge amplitude. One other feature is when we mention something about, you know, the peak time, the amplitude, you have to also think about the waveform. And as you can see here, the kinetics of hyperpolarization gives you this sharp descent, while the A wave has some sort of a broad, what Dr. Tony Robson calls it, rhomboid shape. So this is also pathognomonic. And then you move to the flicker response. As you can see, it's not only subnormal, but it's also delayed. So this is, in summary, the pathognomonic ERG for KCNV2 retinopathy. Any questions? Okay. All right. So this is a condition that Dr. Sosan, I think I can invite you just to stand up here and talk about it, because uh, you're so passionate about it, but I'm going to take the liberty to uh, talk about it a little bit. So, um, enhanced Escon syndrome is quite an interesting condition because it's not um, a strictly retinal dystrophy, it's, it's, it's a developmental disorder. Why is that? Because NR2E3 is actually a transcription factor. And again, if you fall in love with basic science, then transcription factors are really the kings and queens of, of your cells. Okay? Because you go from DNA to messenger RNA, transcription, right? And then translation to, uh, from the messenger RNA to amino acid, right? Okay. Transcription factors actually control how the DNA is being transcribed into messenger RNA. We are really, you know, you know, we are really grateful that such transcription factors, when they affect, you know, the body, they affect only the retina. Because imagine if something that affects the entire body, then you are in trouble, really. So, NR2E3 is a transcription factor, and it actually, uh, during development of the retina, you start off by creating the cones and the ganglion cells. And then, once you have enough cones, there is actually a switch inside the cell that says, okay, we've got enough cones, let's make rods. And this is where NRL and NR2E3 work. So one consequence is that the rods are not being made. Those patients are night blind from the get-go. 
Okay? The second thing that is electrically interesting, despite that if you sit with a patient and show them the ishihara, their visual acuity is good enough, they should be able to answer all the questions, despite it's called enhanced ESCO, as in short wavelength sensitive. Okay? The reason for that is that they still do have LNM options, albeit the majority of the cells are uh, supplied with an option that is more sensitive to blue light, and hence the term enhanced is cone. But that doesn't mean that they are colorblind. Okay? So these are uh, the phenotype is highly variable. And uh, one of the features that you can see in those patients is actually uh, macular schesis. And it can be sometimes very difficult and frustrating to treat. You can see these hyperautofluorescent dots, the classic feature of uh, nominal pigmentation along the arcades, and so on. So the phenotype is highly val variable, and I think if you refer to Dr. Noelati's um, new paper about uh, Subretinal fibrosis, this is also part of the spectrum of enhanced SCON syndrome. So can someone tell me, if I told you this story about, you know, the retinal development, what would you expect, in very broad terms, what would you expect the retinal function to be like? Just to check if you are still awake. And, and there is no embarrassment here. Anybody can just answer and there is no, no right or wrong, just... So the question is, what would you expect the, you know, retinal function to be like? You know, what what sort of elements aren't gonna be there, and what sort of elements are gonna be there, but they're gonna be abnormal. Yeah, I know. But Dr. and your. There will be coffee and uh, donut. Whoever answers anything, anything. What, what, what do you think the rod function is going to be like? We said that there are no rods, right? Okay. So, is the rod specific ERG going to be there? Good. So that's one. Two. The retina is just furnished with abnormal cones. Sometimes when I have a patient coming to my clinic, I tell them, في say for example, Saleh or Ahmed or whoever, okay? في Ahmed في الغرفة. وانت برا الغرفة. قول يا علي. أحمد يقول له نعم. طيب, انت ما تعرف مين اللي جوا الغرفة. بس فيها بس أحمد. وأحمد هذا كل يا مبارك يا صالح أحمد دائما هو اللي يرد عليك هوز أحمد in this case اسكونز بالضبط ف under dark adaptation حنيجي شيء specific كذا وفي on bipolar cells وما أدري إيش وكذا أصلا أحمد ما هو سامع صح you increase the flash intensity وإحنا تكلمنا في البداية I'm just switching to Arabic to wake you up طيب تكلمنا في البداية إنه the bright flash response under dark adaptation في كونز ملاقيف كذا دخلوا في الموضوع صح ولا لا طيب تخيل إنه هو أحمد هذا under dark adaptation برضو أحمد شايف النور أحمد سامعك فأحمد will respond بس بطريقة أحمد under dark adaptation صح طيب تيجي في light adaptation إيش يصير أحمد يرد صح ولا لا طيب لا أحمد حيعطيك نفس الكفاءة ولا نفس السرعة حقة الدكتور فيصل لما تكلم عن light adaptation حيجيك الفليكر أحمد هذا ما هو بنشيط كذا يعني وحرك وكذا لا شوي ياخذ ياخذ وقته تمام لا الفليكر حيكون نورمال لا أمبليتيود ولا البيك تايم حقه حيكون متأخر شوي تمام بس عشان أحمد under dark adaptation under light adaptation قاعد يرد عليك بنفس الصوت حتشوف ال responses under dark and under light adaptation نفس الشكل الحين خاف تجون العيادة هذا بيشن عنده أحمد أوكي فا this is this is the NR two E three retina هذه ال U لا تخافوا منها هذه log unit log unit هذه كانوا زمان كانوا يستخدموا نفس اللايت 
تمام و اللهم صل على محمد يستخدموا فلترز عشان يخلوا اللايت ديم فانت ما تتحكم في اللايت انتنسيتي نفسها ما فيها سويتش وانما تحط الفلتر قدامها فتتغير اللايت انتنسيتي مفهوم الفكرة؟ طيب فهذه very dim flash there is no response once you increase it to standard اللي هو 3 candela في response but you can see it's so subnormal والشيء الثاني you can see even that the peak time is even even for the rods is delayed طيب لما انت ترسم اذا رسمت خط من هنا الى هنا يعني there is a bit of delay there and it's also broad and simplified ما فيها التعقيد حق الاسرائيل البتنشلز ولا تمام؟ لانه احمد هذا انسان يعني رقيق على قد حاله خلاص هو هو اللي حيرد عليك كل مره. لو تلاحظوا if you increase the flash intensity again there is an increase because it still follows the some sort of kinetics it's not the same kinetics as the normal cones obviously but it will increase but if I just tell you that this is dark adapted and this is light adapted they are quite similar. And then the flicker, tablation flicker subnormal and delayed. The shortwave sensitive mechanism is not as uh, accurate, uh, robust as, as the uh, LNM cones. And even if you isolate the S cone responses in somebody who's completely healthy, they are not as robust as the LNM cones. The S cones are minority even in the retina. Almost 2% of the cones only are S cones. So most of this is actually, if not almost all of this is in the normal retina is coming from the LNM cones. هذول الشباب على قد الحال they are responding. اجتهدوا شدوا أحمد شد حيله شوي. One other thing that is quite controversial عشان بس نتفلسف شوية إنه the S cones are somehow similar to the rods in a sense that they don't have connection to off bipolar cells. And nobody knows actually in the NR2E3 retina whether there are of bipolar cells or not anatomically. So this is something just يعني كده أفكار تخطر على البال. What you can see in this patient is the pattern ERG is very very subnormal, almost undetectable from the right eye. But that's not always the case. Some patients with enhanced disc syndrome can have relatively good vision, not excellent, not normal, but they can have good vision. Acute, yes. But we're talking about the you know pattern ERG. One thing is that uh, even in patients who develop macular schizes, and after sometimes the schizes resolves, actually the pattern ERG gets abnormal. So there is some sort of degeneration that takes place in the macula, and there is a good reason for that because the macula is not supposed to have S cones. The, the, the S cones are small minority. And they don't contribute much to the acuity. So if you are furnishing the macula with these abnormal cones, some of them will degenerate. OK. So I think it's a quarter to five. And I think this is a very heavy subject. So, and uh, maybe we can spare it for another time. Hmm? Uh, well, it's about 15 minutes. But I think it's just difficult to explain bradyopsy in 15 minutes. I think people have switched off. But what we can, you know, wrap up with, because also I need you to ask questions, otherwise I'll feel frustrated, um, is that you know now what these examinations can show you. What are the indications? You have to think, I mean, this looks a bit complicated, but basically you have to think about the situation, the indication for electrophysiological testing, and then you request the test, not the other way around. And you can go sequentially. For example, if you have somebody with low vision, then you start by checking, you know, checking simply the refraction of the patient. Believe it or not, I've received some patients in my dystrophy clinic, referred as query retinal dystrophy, and if you send them to the optometrist next door, they were kind enough to refract them, and the Lo and behold, the vision improved from 2200 to 2040 or something with a quick refraction. So don't just jump to do electrophysiology if you don't know what's happening in the retina. You have to think, take history, think about what's going on, and then take it from there.
And then there are certain indications for VEP, as we just mentioned, EOG. Not every patient will need an EOG. Even patients with retinal dystrophy, not every patient will need an ERG. Okay. We'll wrap it. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. And please, please, please consider coming, volunteering for ERG. We need Saudi normative data. We really need it. It's, it's going to be, a, you know, something first of its kind actually in our population and it's for generations to come to rely on.